Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett, televising from Miami. We have another in, a, in the conference series of the conference for pediatric neurosurgery, collaboration of neurosurgical TV in the Department of Surgery in, in the Ames Hospital, A double I M S Hospital, New Delhi, with uh, headed by Jeff, uh, not headed, but he's running this. Uh, he's a course director, Deepak Gupta. Uh, and tonight we have the pleasure of having Sarat Chandra, a neurosurgeon from India, who's going to talk about surgical management of drug-resistant epilepsy. And first we'll introduce the distinguished panel. How you doing, Abdullah? I'm You're doing great, thanks, John. Okay. Um, yes, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Abdullah Rida. Uh, I'm an Egyptian student who is studying medicine in Bucharest, Romania. I finished my third year. I'm going to the fourth year. And uh, me, myself, I'm quite interested in uh, neurosurgery. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what Dr. Sard is going to talk about today regarding uh, epilepsy surgery techniques. Very good. And welcome, Abdullah. Ayyip, can you hear me, Ayyip? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Okay. So, once I. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I hope my audio is clear for you. Yes, yes we can see it well. Oh, perfect. So, yeah, uh, as you know, epilepsy surgery, uh, especially the techniques and the recent advances, is a very huge topic. And I will try to see how well I can cover so that I can give a full flavor of what is the most, most basic stuff or what is the stuff which we know till date. And what is the more exciting stuff that is coming up in the near future? And where are we headed generally in this direction? And our, how our own experience goes in this direction? I assume that this presentation would be for a mixed audience, both for the students who have, uh, some for the students who have very little knowledge on epilepsy surgery, some who already have sound knowledge of basic and would like to know more about the advanced stuff. Some, I believe, also would be for practitioners who already have very good knowledge of epilepsy surgery and would like to know what more is happening here. And still, there could be another facet of uh, people who would be interested to just to recapitulate their knowledge. So you would see that my presentation, hence, is more like an heterogeneous presentation, which would kind of uh, try to take care of all the audiences who would be accessing it now or even later through the YouTube. So we come back to the fundamental question of what is epilepsy surgery. So we have to understand that the most important thing when we say epilepsy surgery means we are performing surgery in a patient in order to make him seizure free or epilepsy free. By the word epilepsy we mean strike which means the person is amenable to have seizures again and again. So as all of you know seizures is not same as epilepsy. So anybody can have seizure as one episode. So you, you have an um, alcohol binge, you don't eat, you can have one seizure. You watch a movie whole night or you don't, you don't eat properly, you are dehydrated, you could have one seizure. So this doesn't mean epilepsy. But for some reason, if the brain becomes susceptible so that it keeps on throwing seizures again and again, it, it is called as epilepsy. And in about approximately one-fourth of these cases, uh, epilepsies are drug resistant and when we perform surgery in order to stop the drug resistant epilepsy that is what we call it as epilepsy surgery. So it's very important for us to understand that the primary aim of surgery is to treat epilepsy and not any underlying pathology of the brain. For instance if the patient has a brain tumor, uh, yeah the brain tumor treatment would be secondary but the primary goal is to actually treat the epilepsy. Now it's also important to understand that we don't call the surgery as epilepsy surgery when we perform surgery for patients who have brain tumors with raised intracranial pressure or uh, when the patient has a few seizures because of a growing brain tumor. Similarly, if you remove the tumor and the patient is seizure free, once again, you don't say that this patient has been operated for epilepsy surgery. Similarly, absence of any lesion on an MRI or a CT scan does not rule out any surgical cause for epilepsy. I believe the burden of epilepsy surgery globally is very, very significant. So even though we do not have any extra any true statistics from India because it's a huge country, but if you perform 
some kind of extrapolative statistics, we find that for every 100 patients, approximately 60 will go ahead to have epilepsy of which 15 will have chronic drug resistant epilepsy. So if we extrapolated these figures to the population in our country, we can say at any given point of time, we have about 200,000 candidates who are actually the suitable candidates who can be cured of the drug resistant epilepsy because of uh, a surgical intervention. So you can understand that the burden of this is indeed quite immense. Now I, I acknowledge Professor Gary Mathern for having provided me this slide and it was also published in Epilepsia which shows the treatment gap for epilepsy by the word treatment gap I mean the difference between what is available and what is actually or ideally required. So in a country like India if we, perf we have approximately we have to perform approximately 15,000 cases a year if we have to keep up just keep up with our caseload of epilepsy surgeries but currently at best we are operating maybe about 500. We have currently at best about 18 tertiary or second level level 2 centers but what we actually require are 600 or more centers. So you can have an idea about the immense treatment gap which exists for this subspeciality. Now this is a paper which has got more than 2000 citations and is perhaps the most well quoted uh, paper in the literature by V. Bittal where using a randomized control trial they demonstrated that the surgical arm for drug resistant epilepsy with mesial temporal sclerosis has a much better outcome than for a similar cohort of patients who have been treated medically. So there is no doubt that the role of surgery is unequivocal. The Many people did try to repli uh, replicate this kind of study and an ERSA trial by Professor Pete Engel is a, uh, uh, is a remarkable uh, uh, is, is a remarkable step in that direction. But however, till date, this remains the most quoted study and perhaps the only class 1 evidence which clearly shows that epilepsy surgery is by and large much superior to treat drug resistant epilepsy as compared to medical treatment. Now this is one of my favorite slides especially for neurosurgeons even though it's been only published in uh, scientific journals which is meant for uh, neurophysiologists or for neurobiologists. Uh, so there is a lot of terms which goes on in literature which says that it, it talks about epileptogenic zone, it talks about epileptogenic focus and then some people more recently are talking about epileptogenic networks. So what are all this? So uh, as of the current concepts, people feel that what exists in the brain which creates a seizure network is called as an epileptogenic network. So they are a group of interlinked neurons which may be close to each other, which are usually close to a lesion if a lesion has been detected on MRI or may be very far away from each other, but they more or less vibrate in the same frequency and they take part in the same epileptogenic process and this closely coordinated group of neurons are defined as the epileptogenic networks. Now initially our view of networks used to be more simplistic because we used to think that if you have a lesion in the center so these group of neurons which actually produce epilepsy surround the epileptogenic uh, surround the lesion and then they produce epilepsy but over a period of time we have understood that the neurons which produce epilepsy need not be close to the lesion. In fact, they might be quite well separated and they might be anatomically located in a much far off lesion, a much, much further off area. Not only that, we have also come to understand that the epileptogenic networks are not static. In the term, in, by static I mean that these lesions, they do not remain constant over a period of time and they keep on expanding or they keep on becoming more complex over a period of time. Which in essence means that if you have a kid who is 5 years old who has drug resistant epilepsy, his networks are going to become much more complex and much more difficult to treat after a period of 10 to 15 years. 
if this child does not undergo any form of treatment during this period of time. That is why the whole idea of this is to make the surgeon and the physician to understand that drug resistant in epilepsy is not the same as antibiotic resistance. Drug resistant in epilepsy does not develop with an overuse of multiple anti-epileptic drugs. Drug resistance in epilepsy is a de novo. It is because of the neurobiological constitution of that particular patient that this person becomes drug resistant. And if you do not treat this drug resistant as early as possible, these epileptogenic networks are going to expand, they are going to become more complex, they are going to keep on growing. And if you try to treat this patient maybe 10 years later, the outcomes are not going to be as good as they would have been if you have treated this patient 10 years before. So it is very important to understand that once a patient has been diagnosed to have drug resistant epilepsy, surgery should be offered as early as possible and there is no point waiting forever or delaying this process forever. Now, uh, it's also important for us to understand that uh, all, the all the pathological spectrums, all the pathological substrates which cause epilepsy are not the same. You could have substrates which I show on the right side which are something like a good outcome substrates because usually over here the substrates can be picked up on MRI. The networks are simple. The epilepsy is of shorter duration. Uh, it usually generally takes a longer, lower cost of investigation to find the epileptogenic networks and does not usually require invasive EEG. And on the left side you have complex substrates which could be usually negative on MRI and obviously they have more complex networks. They would have had seizures for a much more longer duration of time because of which, you know, they would have converted into this kind of substrate from the simple substrate. So there would have been a shift from the right to the left. And generally to investigate this group of patients, the cost of investigation is very high because they require invasive EEG. Yeah, so it is very important to understand when we work up a patient with drug resistant epilepsy, to broadly categorize which kind of substrate would it fit into. And this is a very easy practical method of trying to classify your patients. Does he have a simple network or does he have a complex network? Is a substrate well seen on MRI or is a substrate not seen on MRI? So that itself uh, makes your further decision paradigm very, very easy. Now, uh, many of my students, they often say that they are unable to start an epilepsy surgery program in their department or in their hospital because they do not have all the facilities. I don't think such a uh, argument holds true or it does hold any water because if you see for diagnosing 60% of drug resistant epilepsy all you require is a video EG and a good MRI at least 1.5 Tesla which you and the radiologist knowing how to perform an epilepsy protocol MRI. If you do this, you will be able to pick up 60% of the substrates. Yes, you do require more advanced investigations like a 128 channel, dense array, electrocardiography or EEG would be useful, SPECT with SISCOM and SISCOS facility, PET, and more advanced investigations like a MEG, brain suite, other uh, high frequency oscillation, HFO with uh, EEG source localization, etc. definitely have a much better impact but all of this combined together help in approximately 10 to 30 percent of the residual cases and hence these facilities may be kept at the level one centers whereas the others may be kept at a level two centers or at a smaller centers and in case they are not able to localize the substrate with these two simple tools then the patient may be further referred to a higher center where he or she may be further investigated to find out the epileptogenic networks. The question also comes, what is the need for us to have all the investigations? After all, for a tumor, we do not require anything more than an except an MRI. That's it. We do a contrast MRI and maybe we do some other uh, sequences and then we are able to reasonably make a diagnosis. But then for epilepsy, why do we need to investigate with so many investigations? The reasons are very uh, clear. You have to understand that each of these investigations occupies a specific camp in the X and the Y axis. 
where the x axis stands for the temporal resolution and the y axis stands for the spatial resolution now uh, you can see the mri the mri is the grossest form of investigation which can pick up time only in the terms of days to months to years uh, and it can only pick up the grossest form of the brain whereas meg has got a much higher temporal and spatial resolution similarly fmri spect pet have various temporal and spatial resolutions the basic idea of telling this is that for you to understand that epileptogenesis is an event unlike a tumor which is static you know it's always there whereas epileptogenesis is a dynamic event it changes over a period of time and when you want to capture a event you need something like a video camera which we unfortunately we don't have now falling short of video camera what we can do is we need different snapshots so this is what all the investigations that attempt to provide that attempt to provide different snapshots at different periods of temporal and spatial resolution so that we can understand what is the level of this activity at this particular temporal and spatial uh, event now as per the definition by international league against epilepsy any patient is said to have drug resistant epilepsy if he has failed uh, a combination of two drugs that has been appropriately chosen and have not caused any side effects uh, and uh, was un unable to achieve any seizure freedom so the word appropriateness is very important because obviously you cannot combine drugs like carbamazepine or phenytoin that's a horrible combination similarly uh, you have to give appropriate aids for appropriate pathologies uh, so if you do not give appropriate aids then once again the seizures may become worse so th all these factors are very very important so that is why the definition of drug resistant epilepsy is something which an expert in neurologist or an epileptologist has to make and she or she has to ensure that these two drugs have been well tried out it is also very important to rule out pseudo compliance because may most often the patient may not be taking the drugs uh, regularly every day and in our setup at least we find that 30% of the patients actually have pseudo seizures so that is why it is essential for us to do a video eg for all the cases before we take up for surgery because in many of the cases with drug resistant epilepsy we do come across cases of pseudo seizures uh, uh, so they have to be it's very important that they have to be ruled out uh, ile has suggested that we try for at least a period of 2 years but more recent modifications have said that including one from a, a paper which has been published from our own center in 2000 uh, 2010 suggests that a much more short a shorter duration of 1 year is also suffice because once you establish the patient is drug resistant he is not compliant with two drugs whatever the drugs may be there could be at least 30 drugs in the market but if you appropriately choose any two drugs from the market and the patient is not compliant with them uh, then there is no point trying a third drug because the chance of third drug leading to seizure freedom is less than 1% so that is the time you need to work up the patient for drug resistant epilepsy now we performed this study in our own uh, setup and this included included a large cohort from whole of north india and we found in our study certain predictors right from beginning by which we are able to predict that this patient is likely to become drug resistant so one of the important predictors is presence of a structural abnormality so if a patient has a structural abnormality one can be very sure that is unlikely to be treated uh, can be cured medically similarly if the patient does not respond to the first anti epileptic drug that is also a very very high risk factor for the patient to become drug resistant so one has to keep these two important factors in mind when treating the first seizure so if you treat a first seizure for some reason if you are end, end, ending up finding a substrate on an mri or a structural abnormality on an mri with an exception of neurocystic sarcosis in developing countries like india or in latin america which is very common and can be easily treated medically i'm not talking of neurocystic sarcosis but 
any other structural abnormality if it is detected on MRI or the patient does not adequately respond to the first anti-epileptic drug, then one can be almost pretty sure that this patient is likely to develop drug resistant epilepsy. Now presence of febrile seizures and age of onset before 14 years of age is also one of the important factors in our study which are shown may be responsible for development of drug resistant epilepsy. Now based on this we created something called as a Petri tool and this was based on a cohort of about 500 patients and using this tool on the OPD itself uh, the physician is able to uh, make an assessment whether the patient can be actually uh, identify surgical candidates with drug resistant epilepsy and this particular tool is useful for uh, countries with resource limited settings so one doesn't have to go through all the uh, expensive investigations you just run them through this screening tool and you can be very much sure whether the uh, patient will be a surgical candidate for epilepsy surgery or not. So summarizing, uh, approximately 50 to 60 percent of all the, about approximately 25 percent of all epilepsies, they become drug resistant. 50 to 60 percent of all the drug resistant epilepsies, over here resistant epilepsy means drug resistant epilepsy, they become suitable candidates for epilepsy. We apply the rule of two, which means that if the patient has not responded to a two appropriately chosen drugs in their appropriate dosage, then they should be subjected to a full workup for epilepsy surgery. There is no point trying to go on giving the third and fourth drug. You may give them because still the patient is worked up for surgery, but it is not going to produce any long-term cure. The duration of two years is no longer the lower limit, uh, is, usually, the, is usually not held as a upper limit. Most of the centers prefer to have something like one year or so, because the longer you wait, the more harm it causes to the patient. Now in children, the equations are totally very, very different. Now children brain is very, very uh, soft and it is highly susceptible, it is growing and it can be easily damaged. And most often, the seizures are not so clinically manifest as in adults. In fact, the most subtle type of seizures like infantile spasms are hardly noticeable in children and they can cause severe brain damage and encephalopathy. Hence, in children, the surgery, the surgical option if required should be considered within months, weeks or even sometimes in days. And one should not, obviously the rule of two does not at all appear, uh, apply for in children. So if the ch a child has something like infantile spasms, multiple seizures type, rapidly, rapidly decline cognitive therapy or a surgical substrate like a focal cortical dysplasia or a hemimegalencephaly or an infarct, uh, all these conditions uh, means that the child has a surgical candidate and should be referred for a possible worker for epilepsy surgery. Now, if the MRI is negative, it does not mean that the child still cannot undergo an epilepsy surgery. It means that the child still has to be referred to a higher center for a complete workup. This diagram, again, I have taken it from Professor Gary Mathern, and it's a beautiful diagram, and it shows uh, uh, the brains of children with two identical ages, but one having seizures, and you can see how severe impact the seizure is had on this brain causing because of severe encephalopathy. That is why it is very, very important to treat epilepsy in children as early as possible. The same has been seen in our own experience. We have now an experience of over 2000 cases of epilepsy surgeries of which approximately 700 cases are pediatric and we published 129 of these cases in this paper and hence if you have to consider operating kids, they should be operated as early as possible. Now in epilepsy surgery, we have something called as a concordance. By concordance, we mean that we do imaging, structural imaging like an MRI. Then we do a functional imaging like ictal spect and pet. And then we do a video EG. So one is an electrical, functional and structural. And we try to see if all these three 
modalities, they agree with each other. So if they agree with each other, then the surgeon feels reasonably certain that the networks are where all these modalities agree upon each other. If they do not agree, then there are other complex paradigms which have to be undertaken. But the most important thing is that since this is a multidisciplinary approach, all these cases have to be discussed in a multidisciplinary conference where you have the neurologist, you have the neuroradiologist, you have people from nuclear medicine, you have the neuropsychologist, and all of them they discuss and they talk about the patient and they put the problem, they put the findings together and then they take a collective decision of what is to be done because it's equal responsibility for all of them uh, for having the child to get better. Now summarizing, there are three myths. I know it's taking a long time for me to before I reach the surgical techniques, but believe me, surgical techniques are one of the least important things. The most important thing in, in this presentation is to know when to do surgery and most important when not to do surgery. So it's very important to identify who are the groups who would be benefited by surgery and who are the groups who would not be benefited by surgery. And how important it is for the child to undergo surgery because it can be a birth changing experience for the child. It's not like a tumor surgery. The, the child, it, it's as if the child has taken a rebirth again. So the first myth is that many general practitioners feel that refractory or drug resistant epilepsy can be identified only in the late of late in the course of illness. So that is you give anti-epileptic drugs for 20 years, 30 years, child becomes mentally retarded, he is absolutely useless, you have tried hundreds and tons of drugs and then you say, yeah, this is the time when we should send the child to the surgeon. No, it's absolutely true. Please do not do that. If you have done that, you have killed the child. You have to understand that if from the beginning itself, you can identify whether this child will have drug resistant epilepsy or not. Because drug resistance for epilepsy is not like antibiotic resistance. It does not develop after you give a ton of drugs. It is because of the inherent neurobiological constitution of that particular child. So presence of lower efficacy of the first drug. Similarly, even if you have chosen two appropriate drugs in the appropriate combination and the seizures are not getting controlled. And it is well known that newer anti-epileptic drugs do not change this equation. They can lessen the seizures for a couple of months, but they will not, or the, once again, there is going to be a uh, breakthrough seizures. So in these circumstances, the child has to be started to be worked up early, to be shifted to a center where they can work up for pediatric epilepsy surgery. Now, this is one of the questions with many parents ask me. They say, doctor, it's not a cancer. So at least my child will not die. Why should I undergo a large brain surgery, why should I undergo an open surgery? But the fact is epilepsy kills. Even the risk is very less, which is 0.5% per year, but it is cumulative, which means if the child has had the seizures for about 20 years, the risk of child dying because of epilepsy is 10%. If it is had for 30 years, it's 15%. So it is well known. And most important, repeated attacks of seizures they will knock down a couple of thousand neurons every time you have a seizure. You know, you have 7 billion neurons in the brain. Every time you have a seizure, maybe a couple of neurons, a couple of million neurons are permanently knocked off. But if this keeps on happening for months to years, you're going to lose your child, you're going to lose the identi identification with your child as you identify your child to be. And ultimately, you end up having somebody who is a complete imbecile or a mental retard or someone who has to be taken care of, who is completely incontinent, who is bedridden. Uh, so you have lost that window of opportunity where you could have treated this patient. Now, surgery definitely is not the last resort. It has to be referred as early as possible. It has been shown world over. Even in our center, even in centers across India, including ours, we have demonstrated excellent results at par or even better than many centers across the world. And hence, if, as, uh, if uh, there is an option that uh, a child has to undergo epilepsy surgery, 
uh, this option has to be given to him or her. So who should be referred? So obviously any child who has a lesion, any child who does not respond to the first anti-epileptic drug, any child who does not respond to any number of anti-epileptic drugs, any child with a seizure disorder with a rapidly declining cognitive disorder are all the fit candidates who should be immediately referred to a neurologist who is an expert in dealing with pediatric epilepsies because all of them may be harboring lesions or networks which are potentially amenable for surgical treatment. Now this is some recommendations which we have published, level 1 and level 2 centers. So level 2 is higher centers, my apologies earlier I was quoting the reverse. And level 1 is the lower centers. And uh, it's important for us to have a tired approach. Otherwise uh, it's, it would be very difficult for a level 2 center to handle all kinds of cases. And this is the kind of protocol we have for uh, doing an epilepsy MRI imaging. And you can see it's got many parameters which are very straightforward. It's only important that the radiologist sensitizes himself or himself or herself how to do the sequences in every patient. And believe me, with this, you can end up detecting many, many subtle cases. Ictal spect with syscom and syscos is also very useful for detecting focuses. We usually do positron emission tomography in cases which is completely substrate negative or MRI negative, in which cases they, they are useful for us to detect uh, subtle, tissue, subtle pathologies which are not detectable on MRIs. Now I apologize for this crowded uh, paradigm of management what I have drawn here. But uh, as I explained to you, you will understand that it is not so difficult to understand. So. On the top, we have something. We have a child with a drug-resistant epilepsy. So the first and most important step is to understand whether the MRI is positive or negative. So if the MRI is negative, then we would still recommend that he under, undergoes a repeat MRI as per epilepsy protocol. And surprisingly, in even 60% of the cases, they become positive. In 40% of the cases, they may be still negative. So now, whether they are positive or negative, they go to the next step, which is the video EG. So these two steps are, you know, they are non-compromisable, they are in non-interchangeable, and they are constant. So you have first an MRI, and then you have a video EG. Interictal EG, of course, is always done in cases of patients who come with Caesar semiology. Just to show an example, uh, this is an MRI which is negative. But when we do a second pass MRI where I have shown the red arrow, suddenly you end up picking up all the subtle changes which have been picked up by on MRI. The, all these patients were referred with normal MRIs to our areas, to our center. And when we did an epilepsy protocol MRI, we ended up detecting uh, subtle lesions. And it is very important for these patients because then they were been able to take up for surgery and they had very good outcomes. So this is what, this is a scenario which happens in approximately 40% of the cases. Now in 60% of the cases what happens is the MRI is negative but when you do a more advanced investigations like a PET MRI fusion you find that for instance over here the whole of temporal lobe is hypometabolic and when you go back then suddenly you end up detecting a subtle lesion on the MRI. So in 20% of the cases, you do a more advanced investigation and then you go back and you are able to find out that this, uh, uh, you have been able to actually detect, uh, you've been able to actually detect a lesion retrospectively. Now the fMRI, Now, the, uh, in our center, we have, uh, we have uh, never used WADA for two reasons. Firstly, sodium emetal was never, never uh, easily available in our, in our center. 
or anywhere in India in India for that matter. And secondly, uh, most of our intervention radiologists are too busy to do ODA. But however, we developed our own protocol for fMRI, which has been very effective, and we have been using this for the past uh, 15 years or so, and we have patented the same thing in Hindi. So we have patented the whole software in Hindi. And we are able to generate all kinds of functions, including word generation, syntax generation, comprehension tasks, semantic memory tasks, right? Of, of course, motor is a standard which anybody can do. And this is the kind of uh, paradigms which we have. And just to show that over a period of time, we have developed so much of confidence uh, in our fMRI. For instance, over here, uh, this patient had a lesion in the anterior part of the occipital lobe. So obviously, we were hesitating to go interoccipital because we can risk of damage to bilateral visual fields. Uh, this is on the left side. But when we did an fMRI, we found that the entire language has been uh, shifted either anteriorly or it has been shifted to the opposite side. So we did a surgical approach through the traditional conventional Wernicke's area, and then we took out the lesion, and patient was absolutely intact. So in our experience, we have validated this in over 1,000 cases. And we have found fMRI to be very, very reliable. And it is non-invasive. And we find it very, very convenient to do it in all our patients as a part of preoperative assessment. Now we come to the second part of this paradigm, where we think of doing more advanced imaging like a magnetoencephalography or a PET or a SPECT. Now, a lot of things have been written about PET and SPECT, but our question was that what is the utility of combining both of them? If you combine both PET and SPECT, does it help in predicting a better outcome for the patients? Because such a study has not been published in literature earlier. And we did that. We published the study, and we found that whenever the PET had a concordance with the SPECT, it predicted a good outcome for extratemporal surgeries with a significant p-value. But it did not improve the outcome for temporal lobe surgeries. We also have magnetoencephalography, which is part of a research project, which is the only one of its kind of machine in the whole of North India, and only one of its kind in the world, I think, where it is completely done free of cost, because it's a research tool. And we have done close to 1,000 cases till now. And uh, basically speaking about the magnetoencephalography, uh, what we have is we have an array of uh, squids, which are called as superconducting quantum interfaces devices, uh, which is placed uh, uh, cooled in helium all around. And what MEG does is it basically ends up detecting signals which are 100 million times less than the Earth's magnetic field. So if you have the Earth's magnetic field here, and this is what are the MEG signals. And in order to do that, the patient is to be kept in a magnetically shielded room. Uh, so that all the external magnetic interference, like from the power lines or from the moving vehicles, can all be avoided. So uh, it's, it's an extensive procedure. It takes almost three to four hours per patient. So you initially have a digitization where you put all the electrodes, you put the cap. And this is how the signal shows up. So initially, it shows up like a cluster of dipoles. But more recently, we've been using the Curry software and where we have been able to pick up more focal uh, signals. And more recently, we have been using more advanced methodology by which we have been able to actually demonstrate the propagation of the epileptogenic uh, signal. Just to show a few examples, the lesion here, 23-year-old male, 6 to 7 episodes per week. The fMRI uh, doesn't show any activity over the lesion. And when we did the MEG with S. Loretta, we confirmed that this is actually confirmed. It's, there is a focus right on the spot where we see a lesion on the MRI. And at the time of surgery, we find that the maximum electrocorticographic activity was from the same area, which was MEG positive and which was also MRI positive. So obviously, this gives a great deal of confidence for the surgeon. And once we recept it, 
electrocardiographically we get a normal recording all over and the patient is seizure free similarly we have found that meg is very useful in deciding which lesion to remove particularly in multiple lesions like tuberous sclerosis i have a paper of this epilepsy <coughs> excuse me now electrocardiography is a technique by which the electrical activity can be measured directly from the brain by place, placing an electrode on the surface of the brain it's a very age old technique which has been done right from the time of penfield and there is even though there is not much of class 1 evidence but most of the surgeons do it many more surgeons also love to criticize it and many more surgeons also have given away to invasive uh, eg but then for a developing country like india it was important to revive this technique because many of our patients in fact most of our patients cannot afford to undergo invasive eg so we have to actually innovate our own techniques so that we can make the uh, surgical techniques not only surgically effective but also cost effective so we have done a few modifications first is we have given a scoring system for each electrocardiography and this score we have borrowed from the one which has been uh, published by cook and mathern and uh, we do pre op recordings as well as post op recordings our anesthesia parameters are also kept very very accurately and we have published over two papers on this and then this is just to show for instance 27 year old male 7 to 10 seizures a day neurocystis occosis severe edema uh, so we place an electrocardiographic grid we remove it and finally you can see amount of brain which was removed was quite significant uh, because it was a grade 5 electrocardiographic activity so these are some of the papers which we published uh, uh, we have now more than 1500 cases of experience with E C O G, and we also published. This is a paper which has been published in Epilepsy Research, and we also published our anesthesia parameters. And the grading system we have is one is normal, two depending on the existing situation, and three to five is considered abnormal, depending upon uh, from which area it is coming from or what is underlying pathology. But we always do post op recordings because it gives us a very good feedback. and a reasonable sense of confidence about the degree of resection for instance we have a lesion here it shows a grade 5 the worst kind of ecog score when we put electrocardiographic grid so when we partly remove it till the level of the blue line we find that it normalizes to score 2 but when we resect it till the level of uh, this light blue line then we find that the score normalizes so at this point you know the surgeon gets a good degree of confidence that the resection has been optimal now there are there will be situations where despite all your hypothesis all your pre op investigations and every kind of investigation done we will not be able to reach to an hypothesis in which case an invasive eeg will be required uh, so over there we will have to introduce electrodes uh, and then monitor the patient so the main indications for such uh, condition for invasive eeg is presence of substrate negative epilepsy with a reasonable hypothesis so the, it has to be an hypothesis driven now the strategy we we nowadays we have practically stopped using drips and grids we only use stereo and cephalographic leads and unlike uh, many of the centers from the west what we do is we first create a very strong hypothesis as much as possible using all possible pre operative non invasive investigations so we do a full work up which includes a video eeg which includes an hfo which includes a magnet encephalography pet spect uh, and using this we also do a multimodal imaging then we try to create the best possible hypothesis we go through the mri images again especially through the flare sequences trying to see if there is any subtle cortical dysplasia and then we try to create hypothesis by which we can try to place as few seeg leads as possible and based on that we try to create an hypothesis for the network and go ahead and do the surgery 
Similarly, for lesions located of an eloquent cortex, for mapping eloquent cortex, or for multiple lesions, for discordant preoperative investigations, these are some of the generalized investigations uh, indications for invasive EEG. Just to show an example, a uh, 23 year old male, 3 to 4 episodes per day, uh, most of the episodes happening at night. This chip, this chap was the patient was a child, now is a male, underwent you know six to seven MRIs over the period of ten years. All of them reported normal. You can say this MRI is normal, PET MRI fusion is normal. Now when we did a MEG, we got a very strong dipole in the left basic frontal area. Now fMRI once again shows localization away from this area. So summarizing what do we have? Now ictal spect shows activity from the top, from the vertex area. So summarizing what do we have? Uh, we have MRI which shows normal but on close examination based on the MEG analogy, uh, we find query there could be some cortical dysplasia in the cingulate or in the insular basic frontal area. The video EG is typically suggestive of a frontal semiology. The fMRI shows activity well away from the areas where we plan to do resection. The PET is once again not indicative of anything. Ictal spec is basically on the top of the frontal, once again not coordinating well with the MEG. And the MEG is what kind of correlated to some extent with the video EG. And when we re-examined the MRI over the thin sections on flare sequence by changing the windows, we could see perhaps there may be some areas of cortical dysplasia. We don't know. But that is only on very much, very much on a retrospective analysis. So what did we do? What should we do? Obviously, you know, you cannot, uh, you cannot go and recept in this case. So what we did is we did tibioencephalographic implantation of electrodes. So we have this robotic device called it ROSA, which is very convenient for us to point out to the area where we need to put an electrode. So once that is done, we make a small tube and then finally we inject we uh, uh, we we, we uh, put in the electrode which is the stereoencephalographic electrode so this is how the leads looked like so ultimately we ended up putting seven electrodes so uh, uh, four on the left side because most of the focus was on the left side and three on the right side and then we were quite pleasantly surprised that on fourth day when the patient had a seizure, we found that it was a left basic frontal which started to spike and it spread to the left insular area. So you know this, by this we were clearly able to get an epileptogenic focus. So uh, I went ahead and we did a uh, left frontal resection along with the insular resection as well as a basal opercular resection. And you know it is a much more extensive resection than a frontal lobectomy. Now patient had an initial weakness of about uh, 4 by 5 which was more like an apraxia which is very common with this kind of resections. But over a period of time it improved very rapidly and currently he is seizure free. So this goes to show that if you, if you create a very good hypothesis and you know exactly where to put the leads, you can minimize the number of leads you need to put. And you can also improve the patient's outcome rather than you know go on putting leads everywhere, and then you would lose focus. You wouldn't exactly know how to interpret your results. Now this is an, another interesting case which I thought I would like to show to you. A patient having about five to six seizures per week till now, and about three years ago underwent excision of a neurocystic circle cyst in the anterior part of the occipital lobe because that is what was seen. But in terms of seizure semiology, it was not occipital at all. It was more like a temporal. But when we examined the MRI, the temporal lobe was completely normal, including the MRI, uh, PET MRI fusion. And you can see that the MEG shows a very good activity in the left temporal area. And it is correlating well with ectal spect. So functionally, there is something in the left temporal, but anatomically, the left temporal is normal. 
So what do we do? So obviously it's another case for invasive, but how many electrodes? Do we just go and puncture in some 20 or 30 electrodes and then try to see what's happening? No, we did not. What we did is we just put two electrodes, one within the hippocampus and one just around that pericyst area and the occipital area. And with this, we were beautifully able to demonstrate that the seizure generation is actually arising from the temporal and the occipital lobe is completely quiescent. So we went ahead and performed a left temporal lobectomy after which the patient became seizure free. So we have already gone through a number of surgeries during the course of presentation, but I will quickly show you the principles of other types of surgeries which are there because I have something like uh, three minutes left. So basically surgery could be receptive or it could be disconnective. Uh, so by receptive, we mean, we mean that we remove a part of the brain completely, whereas disconnective is we disconnect that area from the rest of the brain. And these are the various types of surgeries. So basically, they could be divided into a curative surgery as well as a palliative surgeries. And that is a more functional and a more practical way of trying to classify the surgeries. Now, the temporal lobectomy is the commonest type of surgery is done and which has been described by Wilder Penfield the first time and uh, these are the host of structures which have to be removed so one has to understand that it's not just amygdala and hippocampus which is to be removed but also the parahippocampus, the cibiculum, the anterior part of entorhinal cortex, mm, the uh, uncus. Uh, so all the structures have to be removed because you are removing a network, you're not removing a focus. Now, world over meta-analysis has shown that a traditional, a classical anterior temporal lobectomy with amygdala hippocampectomy has a better outcome than a selective amygdala hippocampectomy. Just to show an example, one of our cases, uh, this is the post-op and it's important that in the post-op, the hippocampus has to be resected till the level of superior colliculus. Now, there are other forms of surgery called as disconnective surgery. For instance, the child has a porencephalic cyst with a strong focus of MEG from this area. So we make incision like this and we disconnect. Uh, the, uh, we do a TPO disconnection. So another example of a Sturge Weber syndrome, and for, this is post-op image where a TPO disconnection or the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobe is disconnected from the rest of the brain. Now, there is another form of surgery which is actually very effective, even though it is very, very dramatic and it's very, very major surgery. It's hemispherotomy. We did our first hemispherotomy in the year 2002 in this child. And you can see one of the incisors of this child is missing because this child came with about 400 seizures a day and was intubated unconscious. And we thought we were going to lose the child. And this is the child today. Uh, so uh, when we did the misphorotomy, so this is like a rebirth surgery. And since then, we have done over 70 cases of such hemispherotomy techniques. And we published the first series of hemispherotomy from this country. And the most important indications for hemispherotomy is any kind of hemispheric pathologist. And more recently, we established uh, an endoscopic technique for performing this kind of surgeries, where the whole surgery can be performed through a very small incision. And you can see this is the pre-op and this is the post-op disconnection. So corpus callosotomy is a palliative surgery which is done for drop attacks and recently it is most responsive surgery where the patient has drop attacks especially for a syndrome called as lennox gestalt syndrome and more recently we also described an endoscopic technique for doing corpus callosotomy and the outcome of endoscopic corpus callosotomy with commissurotomy has been found to be superior to that of traditional corpus callosotomy. So I will stop here because my time is over. Uh, I thought I could show you some more of the advanced stuff, but uh, you, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. 
So I I can continue for some time. A little bit. A bit back. We'll just take a couple minutes, right? Uh, yeah, I'm so, on, I'm already there. So yeah, just a couple of minutes. So sure, go yeah, no, no continue. problem. Sir. There is no problem. Continue. Yeah, no problem for me to continue. Yes. So for how long can I continue? If you can give me a time frame, I'll finish it uh, off for that. How much, Vivek? How, how much time are you going to take? Do you think? Uh, about ten minutes more, if you want me to do it comfortably. Well, it's up to Vivek. It's up to Vivek. I have no problem, sir. Please continue. Okay, go ahead. Very good. Thank you, Vivek. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so now uh, in in the palliative stuff, you have something called as vagal nerve stimulation, which is one of the commonest surgical uh, techniques which is performed in the West. Now you have to understand that vagal nerve stimulation is more like a drug. So it does exactly what a new drug will do. It will reduce. Uh, it is effective in 50% of the cases and reduces the seizures by about 50%. Uh, now it is not a magic formula because most of the people, especially from undeveloped countries, think that it is like a cardiac pacemaker. So rather than doing a surgery, you put a pacemaker and you are going to be free of seizures. So as surgeons, it's very important for us to be responsibly speaking to the patients about this technique and telling what could be the shortcomings. Now in our center, we have done about six cases of vagal nerve stimulators. But most often we prefer to do a corpus callosotomy with commissurotomy because of the fact that many of our patients are not very well to do, and also because of the fact that we deal with very severe pathologies of Lennox gastrointestinal drop attacks. We found that doing corpus callosotomy with commissurotomy is actually very very effective for such pathologies. Now. Uh, the other modalities which has kind of drawn interest over the past decade or so has been the neuromodulation, especially using DBS. Uh, now, the most popular trial which has been done is a Santis trial, which has shown that it is more or less as effective as DBS. Uh, it's as effective as VNS, that is vagal nerve stimulation, uh, which brings to the fact that it, it, if VNS is more safer because it's an extra cranial device, why should we use a DBS? Now our experience with uh, DBS has been limited. It's for three cases. So basically, what we do is we put the leads into the anterior thalamic nucleus, and that's the kind of recordings which we get from the anterior thalamic nucleus. And over here, we put leads. We put uh, uh, the electrical leads all over the brain, and then we produce the two types of rhythms. So basically, it is an EEG-driven surgery. Unlike Parkinson, which is an MER driven surgery, you drive the surgery based on your microelectrode recordings. Epilep DBS for epilepsy is driven by what findings you find on the EEG. So initially, at a lower frequency of 2 to 10 hertz, you produce something called driving hertz, driving free rhythm. Now, as you increase the frequency you know, to about 100 to 150, and in our experience, you know, on my personal communication with Arthur Kukert, who has got a large experience from Latin America, we have even increased the frequency to about 200 to 300 hertz. And we find that that actually works out better. You know, and we are able to completely desynchronize the EEG, which means that at this point, the DBS is going to be effective for epilepsy. And that is the uh, end point where it should be programmed. And that's one of the patients with uh, DBA, with the VNS where we have done, who is undergoing programming. Now, uh, laser ablation is another exciting modality, which we did, which we did in few cases, three cases as a part of a workshop, because this device is not currently available in India, but we did it as a part of workshop, courtesy Professor Ashwini Sharan from Thomas Jefferson, uh, in collaboration in, with Medtronic, who are very kind enough to get this completely free of cost here. Now, this is a really exciting tool because uh, it comes up with a very thin lead, which has also got a self-cooling system around it. So the kind of lesions it produces are really microscopic with very minimal damage to the surrounding areas. Uh, so the entire lesion is actually MRI guided. I'm sorry, you can't see the video here, but it plays on the slide mode. Uh, but it, you can actually see in the lesion which is produced on the MRI, and you can be very sure that the surrounding areas are completely saved. 
So during a workshop when we performed, that's Professor Ashwini Sharan here and the entire team from Medtronic and that's Michael Kang, his student. And that's a child who had hypothalamic hematoma, who just had one stitch surgery, who underwent laser ablation for hypothalamic hematoma just half an hour after the surgery. So one can appreciate how minimally invasive this procedure can be. So we do have really exciting days ahead with this kind of technology coming up. So now let us summarize. So is epilepsy surgery worth it? Definitely it's worth it. We have an experience of over 2000 cases. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a rebirth for the patient. You are actually giving a new birth to the patient. You're not curing the patient. Uh, you treat a patient, he or she is seizure free, comes back, he has joined back to the work, the whole family is happy. If it is a girl, she finds a job, she gets married. There are no words of gratitude that they can express to you. You treat a malignant tumor with all due respects. I mean, every pathology has to be treated with respect. Uh, but all these pathologies, they have a limited life cycle. But for epilepsy, if you treat an epilepsy, you know, it is a rebirth. The whole life changes for this patient. Overall results have shown that it is best for mesial temporal sclerosis which is in the range of 80 to 85 percent. It may reduce to 50 to 60 percent over 25 years as shown by Cleveland Clinic. But one has to remember that there are many surgical nuances which may actually modify the outcome. For instance, one of the most important factor is the amount of hippocampus which is removed. Many surgeons just nibble and remove a small portion of hippocampus. That is to be discouraged. You have to remove the hippocampus till the level of superior colliculus and that itself, you know, enhances the outcome to a great extent. And this finding has been demonstrated by no other than uh, uh, by a neurologist who was working with Professor Yasargal and with Professor Yasargal's own cases. So when they followed up, when they did an MRI, they found that these cases, they did well whenever the hippocampus was resected up to the level of superior colliculus. So other cases, temporal resection 75 to 80, extratemporal 60 to 70. Hemispherotomy is very high, sometimes could be 100%. Corpus callosotomy is a palliative 30%. But remember that you are doing corpus callosotomy in a subset of patients who are so sick. They are having hundreds of drop attacks. They are injuring themselves. The parents are in misery. The child has to wear a helmet and moment the drop attacks stop, the quality of life of the parents improve. So just by the fact I say that it's 30%, the figure looks 30% over here, grossly underrates the improvement or the effect or the quality of life it may have on the patient. Multiple subpile transactions again is a, sub, is a palliative procedure, is not very effective. Vagal nerve stimulation has to be considered like a new drug. But if you see all these figures, these are way ahead than less than 1% of improvement that these patients would have had if they would have been given just medical treatment. Now, in our study, we have shown that once seizures stop, the memory and intelligence also improves, provided the damage is not very severe, and most of the milestones of the children will recover back. Certain seizure types, even though may not seem clinically severe, but produces severe brain damage if it is not controlled, example, infantile spasms. Thus, even if sometimes large portions of the brains are resected in epilepsy surgery, cognition is not usually impaired. Control of epilepsy seems to be the bottom line for cognitive and quality of life improvement. So this is a center of excellence for epilepsy, the first of its kind of India and maybe Southeast Asia, where we have a comprehensive clinical research and an investigative center. We have a magnet encephalography. We have a robotic device. We have a full-fledged OT. We have a advanced molecular and cellular lab where we can do a single neuronal recording. We have research faculty. We have dedicated surgeons and dedicated neurologists. Uh, and the whole idea of uh, creating such a focused center is that because it is a multi-speciality disorder, so it is important for all the people from various multi-specialities to sit down, think together, uh, and feel together for this uh, really difficult but very gratifying disease. So these are the few papers which have come out from our uh, COA lab, which has been published in high-impact journals like Genomics, where we are studying on epileptogenic networks. And finally, just a few days away, I would like to invite, if anybody is watching this, 
to our second AIMS NBRC DBT Epilepsy Surgery Neurobiology Workshop, where we are having two renowned faculty. One is Dr. Christopher Skidmore and Dr. Chengguan Wu, both from Thomas Jefferson, where we will have a cadaveric course on day one, followed by live surgeries on day two and three. And the registration, I would say, is the cheapest in the world. It's, it's 2,000 Indian rupees, uh, which would be something like, you know, just a cup, few dollars, that's it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so for those of you who would be watching this video, who can come to India or are in India, they're most welcome to come and attend this workshop. So thank you very much for this opportunity again, and it's been wonderful giving this lecture, and uh, I hope it has been fruitful and useful to all of you who have listened to this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, uh, sir, I say, yeah, it certainly is fruitful and useful. Very comprehensive. You did a lot of work there. Uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of research, a lot of putting together of that presentation. I'm sure that anyone in the field would lo love to hear that. And I hope a lot of people do. Uh, I just have one quick question. Uh, BVX waiting so we won't take too much time. Um, you don't even consider surgery for an epileptic that is responsive to medication or it's only for people that don't respond? Yes, you have asked a very pertinent question, and I'm so glad you asked. Epilepsy is primarily a medical treatment, medical disease treated by medicines. 75% of all epilepsies are treated with medicines. 25% of all epilepsies, they have something called as a drug-resistant epilepsy, that is, they no more respond to the drugs. So these drug-resistant epilepsies are the candidates who may become the candidates for epilepsy surgery. Okay. Not all the cases with epilepsy. So right. on my entire lecture, I have shown some uh, methods by which we can identify these patients who have drug-resistant epilepsy. Okay. Now the second part of the question answer is, that these drug resistant epilepsy, you can identify them very early in the course of disease. So please do not be under the misunderstanding that you have to treat a patient for 20 years before you say that this patient is drug resistant. So if a patient with epilepsy does not respond to the first drug, that is a first warning, warning sign that this patient may have drug resistant epilepsy. If it doesn't respond to the second drug, you are confirmed that you are dealing with a drug resistant epilepsy. So even if you are having 30 drugs in the market, uh, this patient has to be worked up or sent to a higher center and has to be looked into more options of treating his condition. Okay, very good. Am I, clear? Am I clear, John, about this? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, now, Abdullah, do you have any comments or questions? Yes, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because sometimes you speak so much of complex stuff that uh, you sometimes leave some doubts for the most basic stuff. Yes. Okay, Abdullah? Yes, sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the great presentation, great work. Um, thank you. Uh, so I have just a quick question. Uh, the part that you mentioned about uh, the hippocampus being rejected, mm -hmm. uh, doesn't that have any implications on the cognitive functions of the patients afterwards? Yes. See, uh, patients with epilepsy, when you operate them, the cognitive functions actually improve over a period of time. That's the ballpark finding which is found all over the world, but with various caveats. Various caveats means there are certain aspects of functionalities which may be affected after surgery. <clears throat> There are certain other aspects which are not affected. But if you see the overall functioning, overall intelligence, all these things, they improve much better after the surgery is done. And the analogy is very simple because the brain has something called as plaster. I'm sorry if I speak it in a very basic manner, but mm -hmm. assume that a lot of people who listen to this would, uh, uh, you know, would be, you know, would be, basic undergrad students or they may, may be even non-doctors but brain has something called as plasticity mm -hmm. whereby if it that portion of the brain becomes abnormal so these functions are automatically transferred to other areas of the brain so at this point if you remove this area of the brain 
the overall functionality is actually going to improve. The analogy is very same like you, you are running, uh, let us say John is running this uh, uh, neurosurgery television with 10 people. So there is this one guy who is, you know, he has a delegated responsibility equally to this 10 people. And then there is this one guy who doesn't do work anymore and he is just coming late, going off early, doesn't tell where he goes. And then after some time, you know, he is making things uncomfortable for John. He doesn't do any work. So mm -hmm. at the first stage, John will, you know, shift his responsibilities to the nine other people. But then this fellow continues to be a nuisance. You know, he still won't work. He will actually stop others from working. Then in fit of desperation, John will dismiss this, will fire this guy. And then you will find that even with nine people, the overall efficiency has improved. Am I right, John? Yes. I'm saying this? Yeah, yeah. So the brain functions exactly in the same way. So even the number of neurons in this brain are constant. Uh, but if there are a couple of neurons which go bad or they do only things which are causing damage to the body, like producing seizures, the functions of these neurons are now transferred to the rest of the neurons. So at this point, even if you remove these neurons, over a period of time, the effect you're going to have is only a good effect. So your, your many functions are actually going to improve. Very good. Okay, okay. we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Sirat, can you get off the hangout there? Get, just get off the speech chair. So we, we, I don't think uh, anyone's seen your face uh, during the presentation. Okay. Just click on that green arrow on the far left. Far left. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, and we'll see you in an hour. Thank you. You're welcome to stay. We're going to finish, finish this, and we'll start the next one. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay, okay, that ends that one, and we're going to start Vivek. Well, let me introduce you, Vivek, so we'll make it a separate video, okay? Are you there, Vivek? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, okay. is your camera working, Vivek? Pardon? Is your camera working? It's not on there, it looks like. Um, yeah, you want to try to manipulate, move, try to try to make the camera work. I'm not sure why it's not working. Uh, okay, well, it's not necessary, really. Uh, if you want to go without it, it's okay with me. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, I okay. can go without. Okay, okay. Let me just introduce you first. Hold on, hold on. Okay. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett, televising from Miami for Neurosurgical TV. We have another in, a conf in the conference of pediatric neurosurgery. We're affiliating with the the A double uh, IMS Hospital in New Delhi, with led by Deepak Gupta of the Neurosurgical Department. Uh, we're having a conference on pediatric neurosurgery, and today we have the honor of having. Vivek Tandon, MD, uh, he's going to give us a talk on neural imaging of pediatric brain tumors. But first, uh, let me introduce the panel. Hello, uh, Sarat, can you just introduce yourself, please? Sarat, can you? Oh, there he goes. Okay, Vivek, uh, it's all yours. Welcome. Yeah, so should I start? Yes, please. So can you see me online? Right I, can, now? I can see the presentation, fine. Okay, so so hi everybody. Hello. I will be speaking on pediatric brain tumor imaging and what we should be doing, how we should be diagnosing. The most important aspect for a neurosurgeon is first to understand where the tumor is located. Whether it is presentation. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Someone joining late here. Okay, you're all set. So whether it is extraaxial or intraaxial, whether tumor is benign or malignant, and what kind of tumor is that? So when we want to analyze whether whether a lesion is extraaxial we look for a CSF cleft, cortical grave between mass and the white matter, and usually the extra 
age lesions, they displace the subarachnoid vessels and space. They are broad, dural based, and they show bony reaction. In comparison to that, when you look at the intraaxial lesions, they usually narrow the CSF space. They displace the cortex towards the periphery. And edema starts from the boundary of the tumor. Like in this case, you can see that, like in this case, oh, where the presentation is. Like in this case, you can see here that it's an extraaxial tumor, probably a meningioma. It is broad, dural based. There is a CSF cleft which is there, and the cortical gray matter which is here, it's slightly pushed and not infiltrated. Excuse me, Vivek. Like, uh, you're, you're on the slide. I, I don't know if the slides are advancing. You're on the location slide now. Is it on the location slide? Yeah, now, okay, now extra axial versus intra axial. Is that the right slide? Yeah, it's the right slide. Okay, okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Now, can you see now? Yeah, I can see extra axial versus intra axial. So, when you look at the intra axial tumor, you see here that the, though it looks broad based, but still there is some amount of cortical mantle which is present between the tumor and the dura. Moreover, the tumor looks like infiltrating the cortical matter here. And usually in such patients, when the edema starts, it will start immediately from the boundary of the tumor. While in these cases, when the edema starts, the vasogenic edema usually is slightly away from the site of the tumor. So this is what we are looking at to differentiate between extra and intraaxial location, intra location, intra tumor. The location of the tumor, again, is extremely important. In pediatric patients, most of the tumors are located in the infratentorial compartment. Most of the tumors are the most common tumors are cerebellar astrocytomas in the infratentorial compartment, followed by medulloblastomas, brainstem glamas, and ependymomas. In the supratentorial region, it is only around 13 to 14 percent of all pediatric brain tumors are seen. Most, co most common tumor is astrocytoma in that region. 90 percent of the brain tumors in neonates are neuroectodermal in origin, and teratoma is one of the most common tumors that are seen in the neonates. When we are looking at a picture of an MRI, we can surely distinguish between a benign or a malignant lesion. A tumor invading and destroying the normal brain tissue with a lot of edema and, uh, and tissue necrosis is likely to be a malignant tumor. However, a tumor pressing on the normal tissue and causing increased pressure within brain because of that might be a benign tumor. During the course of this lecture, we will be discussing pilocytic astrocytomas, ependymomas, medulloblastomas, brainstem glamas, hypothalamic hematoma, optic pathway, hypothal optic pathway tumors, choroid plexus tumors, craniopharyngiomas, germ cell tumors, SEGA, ganglioglioma, peanuts, Langerhans Langer cells, histiocytosis, epidermoid, and dermoid. Coming to the pilocytic astrocytomas, these are the most common tumors which are seen in the pediatric age group. Around 40 to 50 percent of primary brain tumors in pediatric age group can be because of the pilocytic astrocytomas. The incidence between male and female is usually same. There is no difference. There is no, and the most common age group is between 5 to 15 years. Features of raised ICP are seen when they are located in the supratentorial compartment and when they are involving the cerebellum, because since they are laterally placed or involving the vermis, a person can have ataxia. These tumors are usually solid and cystic. They have an enhancing mural nodule, and 20% of these patients can have calcification, which can be appreciated in CT or in the GRE images, which appears as a blooming. Though these are low-grade tumors, but surprisingly, they, when you do an MR spectroscopy in these patients, the appearance is of high-grade tumor with choline peaks. The 25-year rate of survival is very good, and these patients usually survive 90% of the time. And this is a picture of a pilocytic astrocytoma that we operated. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt again. 
Please, Nick, I'm sorry to interrupt. You're not showing the slide. You need to click on the slide on the left column to change it. Yeah, okay, that's it. Pylocystic astrocytoma, okay. You got to click on the left column. Okay. Okay. So, how do I do it then? From well, you, here? You click, yeah, you click on the left column to change the slide. Each slide, you click on it to change it. But these slides, they have an animation. So, will they work like this? Uh, the animation is not working. The pylocystic astrocytoma? Yeah, this slide has an animation. So, this animation, I believe, it's not working. No, okay. Here. No. So how do I do it then? Well, you, well uh, how you do the animation? Yeah. Um, I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, click on it twice. Have you tried clicking on it twice? Click on it twice. See if that works. No, it's not working. Well, well, I suppose we'll have to do without the animation for now. From here, it's not working. But when no. I'm using it from the main uh, PowerPoint presentation, then I believe it's working here. Oh, okay. Well, whatever you want to try. You want to try so something can, different? Can you, see, can you see right now? I can see the pyelocystic astrocytoma, but no, 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 no animation is working. Oh, so. Anyways, so, then what I can do is I can present maybe without animations. What yeah, I said guess that. I guess so. And just to change the slide, click on the column on the left. But okay. even the slides are not changing from the Google Hangout. No, site. no, they're not changing. They're changing. Okay, just let me know when you want to change the slide. I'll tell you if it changes. Okay. 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 So this is a case of pilocytic astrocytoma. Usually these tumors are hypo-intense on T1-weighted images, hyper-intense on T2-weighted images. And unfortunately, since that uh, PowerPoint is not working, I can't show you that these are high, these tumors enhance brilliantly on contrast. If there is a mural nodule, that part of the mural nodule is going to enhance. And this is what the appearance of these tumors are. These are usually benign tumors. And once excision has been done, you see a good survival rate in these patients. Now, John, I want to change the slide. How okay, do I do change, it? Let's see you change it. So click, click on the slide on the left, on the left column. Yeah, I'm doing that, but it's not working. Oh, it's not changing? OK. No. Geez, I, I, I can't remember. How do we do this in rehearsal? Yeah, but it was changing then. Oh, it was? OK. Well, let's go back uh, to figure out what we did. There, it, uh, cha it changed. It OK. Changed. Okay. You got to click on the slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now coming to the medulloblastomas, these are malignant tumors. 15 to 20 percent of the pediatric brain tumors, they comprise of pediatric brain tumors. Four to, four, four to 11 years is the age group, and maximum age of maximum number of patients are seen at five years of age. The male to female ratio is two is to one, and one third of these patients they present with drop metastasis. These tumors usually arise from the superior medullary vellum. And when you look at the MRI picture of these patients, you usually can make out the uh, brain stem versus the tumor interface in these patients if it is not invaded. They are in children, they are usually located in the midline, while in adults, they are usually located on the lateral aspect. They show Features of, features of raised ICP at the clinical presentation. Apart from that, patients may have cerebellar symptoms also. The five-year survival for the disseminated tumors is around 35%. If these patients have drop meds or the cerebellum is studied with the metastasis, then it's around 35%. But for non-disseminated patients, survival is good. 60 to 70% of these patients survive. Coming to the MRI picture, they, on T1-weighted scan, these tumors are hypo-intense to gray matter. On contrast, they enhance heterogeneously. T2 to flare, they are iso to hyper-intense to gray matter. Because of the heterogeneous nature of these tumors, because of the areas of calcification and necrosis, it is usually heterogeneous picture that we see. In DWI imaging, the, there is restriction. 
because these are round cell tumor the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio is usually low the new and because of that restriction is seen with low adc values mr spectroscopy as is expected in malignant tumors shows elevated choline decreased na and may also show a taurine peak at 5 this is a picture of medulloblastoma which shows on t1 weighted scan it is iso to hypo intense on t2 weighted scan the tumor is hyper intense and on giving contrast there is brilliant to heterogeneous enhancement which is seen in the axial sag and the coronal images and this is a diffusion weighted scan of this patient which shows that areas of restriction in the tumor because of the high cellularity and content of these tumors with low adc values and this is quite pathognomonic of the medulloblastomas coming to supratentorial uh, primitive neuroectodermal tumors like medulloblastomas these are also round cell tumors pineoblastomas are the most common form of these tumors followed by ependymoblastoma and medulloepitheliomas the mean age of occurrence of these tumors is around 5 years they can be solid and cystic the mri has interestingly though these are malignant tumors but the in the mri picture you can see that the peritumoral edema usually is low they have heterogeneous contrast enhancement because of the uh, because of the necrosis which is there in these tumors and some of them also might be harboring solid and cystic areas the diffusion weighted images they usually show restriction at times when they are highly malignant and necrosis is there mr spectroscopy shows elevated choline and decreased na ratio coming to ependymomas these are around 10% of the primary brain tumors in children are because of ependymomas 70% of ependymomas are usually infratentorial and it's more commonly seen in male patients it has a bimodal peak distribution for the occurrence in and the first peak is around 1 to 5 years of age and the second peak is around 35 years of age they arise from the fourth ventricle these are plastic tumors in the sense when they start when this when the tumor starts growing into the fourth ventricle it can expand the fourth ventricle and it also goes out through the foramen of lushki and mejendi and that is why you have the typical appearance that you see in these tumors the patients usually present with raised icp and the five year survival for these patients is around 60 to 70% 50% of these patients they have calcification and which can be very well appreciated in the ct scan and the gradient images where a blooming is seen this this is a slide of a patient of ependymoma that i operated few days back you can see the tumor is iso intense and it has cystic areas in it which are bright on t2 weighted images and on flare all and in dwi images there is some amount of restriction the tumor shows contrast enhancement which is heterogeneous in nature and here you can see the tumor is going out through the foramen of lushka towards the outer aspect of the cp angle cisterns coming to hypothalamic hypothalamatoma uh, these are basically heterotopias they are not tumors in true sense they are heterotopias they are iso intense to gray matter on t1 weighted images and t2 weighted images the tumor uh, can be sessile or pedunculated there is no enhancement on contrast they can have some amount of fat and they can have some amount of cysts the usual presentation is uh, which which is there is elastic seizures or precocious puberty and these are uh, very treatable lesions you can do gamma knife you can do laser surgery you can do disconnection surgery for these patients and dr chandra had just shown you in the previous lecture how we had operated few of these patients with good outcomes coming to optico chiasmatic glaumas 10 to 15% of supratentorial tumors are associated with neuro 10 to 15% of supratentorial tumors in pediatric age group can be because of optico chiasmatic glauma 
These tumors are found in association with neurofibromatosis. The histopathological examination usually shows juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, which are low-grade tumors, WHO grade 1 tumors. Patients usually present with decreased vision or diencephalic syndrome, where they might be cachexic, where they might be anorexic also, diabetes insipidus because of the pituitary involvement, or endocrine dysfunction, which can range from uh, hypopituitarism to precocious puberty in these patients. Since these are low-grade tumors, they are pilocytic tumors, they show a similar kind of a picture, which is on T1-weighted scan, you will see a hypo-intense mass. On T2-weighted scan, you see a hyper-intense mass, and on flare, hyper-intensity is also seen. On giving contrast, solid part of the tumor usually enhances. A solid part of the tumor usually enhances. And this is what the picture looks like. This is a T1 contrast fat sat image. You can see that there is some amount of enhancement which is there. And this is another patient of opticochiasmatic glioma where a brilliant enhancement is seen and the tumor is seen involving the optic pathway and follows the optic pathway and can reach even up to the brain stem. This is a T2-weighted scan which shows a tumor in the opticochiasmatic region and the tumor is bright on T2-weighted and flare, flare images. This is a flare image. The coming to choroid plexus tumor, 70% of these tumor occur before the age of two years. There is male preponderance. The lateral ventricle is usually involved and it is the trigone of the lateral ventricle from where most of these tumors arise. Most are benign tumors. They show features of raised ICP at the time of presentation. It is very difficult to differentiate carcinoma from papilloma without the histopathological examination. It is the histological diagnosis that clinches one diagnosis or the another. The treatment of choice obviously for these patients is surgery and they have a good five year survival. In the MRI or the imaging part, you will see a lobulated mass which is homogeneous it is a homogeneous mass usually located inside the ventricle and it has intense enhancement which can be appreciated on a CT scan or on an MRI. Choroid plexus carcinomas, when you compare their imaging to the choroid plexus papilloma, you will see a minor difference in the form of these tumors might be irregular if they are highly malignant and they also may show vasogenic edema because of the involvement of the surrounding vessels. And this is a picture of this is a picture of a patient of choroid plexus, car, plexus tumor. This is a T1 weighted scan which shows the tumor is involving the whole of the ventricle probably started from the trigone and it has now involved the whole ventricle. The flare weighted image you can see it as a hyper intensity in the region they are located inside the ventricle. On SWI imaging, there can be areas of microbleeds which might be there and on GRE they might also bloom. While on the, uh, while on the giving contrast, you can see a lobulated mass which is enhancing on contrast. And this is the scan of another patient which shows a lobulated mass inside the ventricle and this mass is this mass is showing brilliant enhancement. Coming to craniopharyngiomas, craniopharyngiomas are the tumors which are seen in adults as well as in children. In children, the most common variety of craniopharyngioma that we see is admantinomatous type, while in adults, it is the papilloma type of craniopharyngioma that is usually seen. These patients usually present with uh, hypopituitarism, diabetes insipidus, and at times, because of the mass effect of the tumor, the patients might have the visual symptoms also. Or due to the involvement of the large tumors like these, a patient can have symptoms pertaining to the frontal lobe or to the compression of the brainstem can lead to uh, long track signs or uh, symptoms due to the brainstem compression in these patients. 
and these can be multi compartmental tumors these are solid and cystic tumors and they can have areas of calcification within them this is just one of the tumors that we operated few days back it's showing that on a t1 weighted image image there is a hyper intense uh, cystic area which is seen inside the brain which is involving multiple compartment the supratentorial compartment and the infratentorial compartment this hyper intensity in this kind of a cystic mass is because of the fluid that these tumors contain which is a machine oil like fluid which is there and because of the particulate matter in it there is hyper intensity that can be seen and this is just one example few examples of craniopharyngiomas this is a patient where you can see on a ct scan that there are few areas of calcification which are well evident and there is an area of cystic cavity uh, uh, which is also present such to but such appearance is very characteristic in this region for craniopharyngiomas this is a t2 weighted scan showing a tumor in the cellar suprasellar region which hyper intensity that shows fluid and with some areas which have solid component also and on contrast based images the solid part of the tumor shows heterogeneous con uh, contrast enhancement in most of the cases coming to brain stem glioma 15% of primary brain tumors can be brain stem gliomas 80% of these tumors which are brain stem gliomas are half high grade in nature when they occur in children the there is no male to female preponderance the age group usually that is involved is 3 to 10 years pons is the most common site there is these tumors are classified into four types it can be diffuse involving the whole of pons expanding the pons focal arising from a from a particular site in the brain stem and exophytic when it is growing outside rather than inside cervical medullary when it is located in the cervical medullary region the best prognosis is when the tumor is exophytic and focal and the worst once when it is diffuse because excision of diffuse type of a pontine glioma is extremely difficult and may not be feasible the differential diagnosis is of because of the encephalitis the differentiating point is the expansion of the brain stem in these tumors these are usually non aggressive tumors if they occur in association with neurofibromatosis the usual presenting symptoms of these patients are involvement of the cranial nerve and seventh nerve palsies which are involving the both sides and also presence of log track signs or other cranial nerve deficits depending upon the site of the tumor and the extent of its growth this is an example of a brain stem glioma that we operated in the last week you can see there is a tumor involving the brain stem it has a cystic part and it also has a solid part which is there usually these tumors are solid in nature unlike this example they are usually solid in nature expanding whole of the brain stem whole of the brain stem and enhancing on contrast at times when an mrs is done and the voxels are placed in this region usually a choline peak is seen with decreased naa peak and the ratio of it is rise and taurine is also in, uh, increased coming to germ cell tumors in germ cell tumors they are very common in the pediatric age group most of the patients with germ cell tumor most of the patients with germ cell tumors uh, they have a midline tumor which is there they have a midline tumor and the most common varieties of germ cell tumors are germinomas teratomas and the germinomas and teratomas these are usually midline tumors which are located in the pineal region there is male preponderance and except benign teratoma all are considered as malignant germinomas they do have a better prognosis tumor markers like beta hcg afp and ldh they might be elevated but in patients of say germinoma at times all the markers they are in the normal range 
Most of the tumors are not radio sensitive, but some like germinomas are extremely radio sensitive tumors and prognosis in such patients is very good. This is an example of a patient with germinoma. You can see a brilliantly enhancing mass in the region of the pineal gland. And these patients are usually male and young, young males, it's a common diagnosis. These tumors can have droplets and they can involve the pituitary region also. That clinches the diagnosis most of the time. Since these are highly cellular tumors, therefore on T2 weighted images, they might appear hypointense. And on DWI weighted images, these tumors can show restricted areas of diffusion. I'm not sure why the uh, why the animation is not working, but this is one example of the previous tumor where they show where they we have shown that the MR perfusion so shows increased perfusion in the region of the tumor that is also one of the hallmark of the germ cell tumor. Another form of tumor is teratoma. It is in 2 to 5 percent of primary brain tumors are teratomas. They are again more commonly seen in males, but mostly teratomas are benign tumors, exception being the malignant ones, but most of them are benign tumors. Most of the patients they present with hydrocephalus as they are located in the midline region and because of the compression of the aqueduct, usually these patients develop hydrocephalus. In the pineal region, when they are seen, they usually have some degree of calcification and there is fat also. The fat appears like a clump in these patients. Soft tissue may show enhancement and malignant ones may show edema and irregularity. This is an example of a patient where the teratoma is seen. It's a large tumor, solid cystic tumor on T1 weighted images and it has probably a malignant type of tumor also because you can see there is a area of hyper in, uh, hyper intensity which shows maybe bleed has happened and it's a fluid level which is seen in the ventricles also. But most of these patients will have areas which are bright on T1. These are lipomatous areas and areas which show some degree of enhancement and these are the areas which are of soft tissue and on CT you can look at the calcifications which might also be seen in this region. Subependymal giant cell tumors, they are associated with tuberous sclerosis, they occur near the foramen of Monroe and patients with tuberous sclerosis who have this kind of a lesion appearing on the contrast scan which are brilliantly enhancing on contrast, they are usually subependymal giant cell tumors. Hydrocephalus is a common feature in these patients because of the periventricular location. These are low grade WHO grade 1 kind of tumors usually. Ganglioglymas, these are the tumors that are usually uh, seen in the temporal lobe. They, are, they have a very common occurrence pattern in the children and they have a very common occurrence patterns in the children. Usually males are more when compared to females. The, most of these patients present at the age of three to six months with the epilepsy. And they are usually cortical based. They have a nodule which enhances on contrast. They can also present with hydrocephalus, but 75% of these patients, they usually survive beyond five years after a good surgery. This is just one example which shows that there is a lesion, solid cystic lesion probably which is present in the temporal region on the right side and on GRE it shows blooming which is there. It is because of the calcification which is present in the lesion. In the post contrast you can see there is enhancement in the contrast in this case. Coming to uh, d -nuts, these are benign tumors. 20% 20 20 of these patients, they present with refractory seizures. Most of these cases have lesions in the temporal lobe. These can be solid or cystic. They are associated very commonly with particle dysplasias and ganglioglamas. 
This trypin pathology is rare, but many times it is seen. They are slow to grow or they may not grow at all. The cortical based lesions can also be multicystic. Some of them they have calcification, uh, but 40% of these cases they show a minor degree of enhancement. And the characteristic feature is bright rim that you see on the flare, which is which is can be appreciated here also. Their typical appearance is wedge shaped. Complete excision of these tumors leads to a good survival and prognosis. The Langerhans histiocytosis is actually a disorder of the reticuloendothelial system. These tumors can rarely involve the skull also and in Calvaria when they present you can see here if I move this image maybe here then maybe you can appreciate more because the uh, animation is not working. It, they present like punched holes. These lesions on CT scan show erosion in the calvaria and the edges of the bone are usually beveled. On MRI, these lesions can present with hyper intensity which can be appreciated on contrast. They brilliantly enhance on contrast and in CT also they are hyper intense, high, uh, uh, hyper dense and on giving contrast these lesions enhance they have a good prognosis and usually are amenable to surgery when they are located on the surface of the scalp. And coming to the, uh, towards the end of the slides that I have, epidermoid and dermoids are also extremely common tumors that we come across. Epidermoids are more, co more common when we compare them with dermoids. They contain keratin, cholesterol, and cell debris. While the dermoids, they have same kind of a keratin that you see in dermoid, epidermoid. Apart from that, they also have hairs and sebum. The lining of epidermoid is because is stratified squamous epithelium. While in dermoid, there are also some dermal appendages which are present. The location of epidermoid can be midline but more often than not we see them in the lateral aspect. While the dermoids, they are mostly located in the midline. They are epidermoids are usually isolated lesions that one can find in the brain, but dermoids can be associated with other anomalies involving the whole of body in 50% of the cases. The meningitis that occurs in epidermoid is usually aseptic in nature. While in dermoid, the meningitis that happens is bacterial in nature and it is due to the dermoid having a communication from the outside. This is a picture of a patient with dermoid that we operated few months back and you can see the dermoid is located in the midline. It has a hypo intense area with a hyper intense area which is there and the hyper intensity can be in T1 weighted images due to the fat which might be present in these lesions or uh, these are more heterogeneous in comparison to the derm uh, epidermoids that we see. This is an example of an epidermoid case which we have operated which, uh, which was there and this patient has hypo intensity in the CP angle lesion and which is bright, which is brighter or hyper intense on T2 weighted images and characteristically they can be differentiated from arachnoid cyst by the restriction that is seen in DWI images. Thank you. Very, very good. Very, very good. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Vivek. Well, what a teaching. Well, what, a uh, what a teaching uh, presentation. What a teaching presentation. Uh, and don't worry, lots of students will see it on video. Uh, do you have any comments or questions, Deepak? I don't know if you're there. Uh, your icon's there. John, I couldn't understand why the animations were not working. So no, no, unfortunately. Slides and lot of animation that was there in the slides. Well, we, you know, we can always repeat it at a time of your convenience if you want, and we'll try to yeah. figure. We'll try to figure it out. I'll be glad to repeat it, and then we can just insert it with the rest of the presentation. Okay. Not now, but have it, you know, sometime this week, if you want, I'll be glad to repeat it, and we'll fix your camera too. 
Okay. Okay, does that sound good? Yeah. Okay, super. Thank you very much. And just let me know. You got my email address, and uh, we'll get together and just do it again. It's ex you know excellent. I'm sure. I wish we had more students here, but they'll certainly see you on video. Okay. Okay. Thank thanks. You. Thanks, Doc. Okay, then we get to, uh, uh, let's see who we have here. Sarat, Sarat back, okay. This, this, this one's over now. Let me get Sarat back. So where are you, Vivek? You're in, in New Delhi? Yeah, I'm in New Delhi. Okay, you've been there, is that where you trained and everything? Have you lived there all your life? Pardon? Have you lived there all your life, New Delhi? No, no, not, not throughout my life, but uh, for last around eight to nine years I've been here in Delhi. Where'd you, where, where were you before? I was in different parts of India. I was in Madhya Pradesh, that is the central India. I was in Uttar Pradesh, that is again towards the northern part of the country. And this is where I had done my schooling and everything. Well, what's your favorite part of the country? Um, favorite part is the northern part of the country where Himalayas are located. Well, the Himalayas? Yeah. Over in Nepal. Is Nepal actually a separate country or is it part of India? No, Nepal is a different country altogether. The, okay. That's the only other country apart from India where Hinduism is practiced. So we are kind of neighbors who are closely related in terms of the cultural beliefs and socio-economically as well. So okay. it's a neighboring country, but they have their own constitution. Everything is separate, and mm -hmm. but we are culturally very much linked. Oh, OK. Yeah, no, Ike is from, from India, though. He's living in Nepal. Do you know Ike? Ike Cherian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's from Nepal. No, he's from India, I think. But he's living yeah, in Nepal. I'm from India only. Yeah. And, uh, he, so, he, he's got a very interesting story. He just went up to visit, and he liked it so much, he found a job there. <laughs> so, John, can I leave? Yes, you can. You can. I'll, I'll, I'm just waiting for uh, the next speaker, and I'll we'll be we're gonna probably edit the video and we'll send it to you. Uh, okay. But but again, I'm I'm open to doing another one if you want. You want to do another one if you see the video and you say, well, John, I want to do another one. Fine, I'll be glad to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Oh, I can finally see your picture there. Yeah, now I think it's working. No, no, I don't know how, how we do that. We, we got your picture there. I don't um, know. I just switched off the screen sharing, and then it has started working. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, because when you came in, it, there was just a blank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, okay. the, the computer is funny. It does things that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good day. Thank you. Yep. And now Sneha, Sneha, is that you? Can you unmute and talk to identify yourself? I'm going to try. Okay. okay. Sneha, Sneha. Hello, Sneha. Hello, oh, oh, who's there? Sneha?
Surat. Oh, okay. And then Vivek, he's back. <laughs> Accidentally. Oh, okay. I'm leaving. Thank you, John. Bye bye. What's that? Okay.
Hello, Deepak. Okay, you might as well end, ending this video. Ending this video, the next figure did not show up. 